YouTube. My name is Natalie. I'm a criminal defense attorney and welcome to my channel. So today's video is going to be a little bit different for you guys. I hope that you're okay with this, but this came very highly suggested from a subscriber of mine who sent this to me in my email and he had a, a great disclaimer, which was that this doesn't come with a video. This doesn't come with photographs or anything. This is a judge's decision disbarring um, an attorney from the practice of law um, and it's in the state of Connecticut and it's in regards to a, a family case that this attorney handled and as a result of her handling of this one case she was disbarred removed from the practice of law in the state of Connecticut. I thought that this was completely fascinating even though I know it's not on video so it might not be as engaging to some of you but the behavior that is outlined here is just so outrageous um, and so I wanted to go through it with you guys and see what you thought about it. Read along with me as we see why this attorney was disbarred from the practice of law. The court disbars Nicola Kunha through her grave misconduct, she has forfeited her position as an attorney and an officer of this court. From the filing of this memorandum and order, she may lo no longer practice law in the state or appear before a court in this jurisdiction on behalf of any other person other than herself, which means she can represent herself as a pro se litigant, but she can never represent another person as an attorney. Whatever the fashion in ordinary public discourse in court, lies by lawyers will be punished by judges. That is such strong language. Judges tend to say things like they were dishonest or they obfuscated. They are very unlikely to say things like this lawyer lied. Even less than truthful, saying an attorney lied is a big deal or anyone in the court. This court has already found that Ms. Kunha repeatedly pressed empty and malicious claims that Judge Gerard Adelman favored Jews, protected Chesters, and discriminated against the disabled. Now the question of Ms. Kunha's punishment is at hand. To be just, the punishment must fit the wrong. So it's important to note that here, the offenses were particularly rank. They not only involved a fraud on the court, but a scurrilous assault on the integrity of a judge. The offense was aggravated by its context and by Ms. Kunha's behavior at the hearing on potential punishment. She is wrong to think the Constitution permits a lawyer to say anything she wants in court no matter how baseless it may be. The First Amendment does not give a commissioner of the Superior Court the right to intentionally deceive the court that granted her that commission. The court has the right to take away that commission and for good cause, it chooses to do so now. This is strong, strong language. It is very, uh, it is the, the most serious uh, punishment an attorney can receive for what they do in the practice of law to be disbarred. We can be suspended. We can be warned. We can be reprimanded. Um, those can be administrative reprimands, formal reprimands, informal reprimands. They can be anything from, hey, write a letter telling us that you explain why what you did was wrong and not in keeping with the rules up to you know, it's over for you, you can no longer practice. So they're saying it's over for her, she can no longer practice. Miss Kunha's offenses were most serious. Miss Kunha's offenses involved three baseless claims. She claimed and then failed to show a scintilla of evidence to prove that Judge Edelman was biased against non-Jews, was biased against the disabled, and protected Chesters. The court said enough about the empty claim concerning the disabled in its particular opinion, but it's worth reviewing the other two matters because they are unusually serious claims and she pressed them repeatedly. The claims also arose following Judge Edelman's referral to this judge of the question raised by Ms. Kunha during the trial of this case. After she berated Judge Edelman repeatedly, he even considered declaring a mistrial 
but ultimately made the referral instead. When I initially considered the referral, it seemed to the court that there was nothing to do about it. Judge Edelman didn't move to disqualify himself and no party had moved to disqualify him. But when the court asked the parties if either side was seeking to disqualify Judge Edelman, Ms. Kunha said she was and then filed a motion to do so. At the hearing on the motion to disqualify, Ms. Kunha repeatedly claimed, starting on page four of the Exhibit A transcript, that Judge Edelman also has a bias against anyone that is not of the Jewish faith. On that same page, she claimed she was making this claim on a significant amount of information that has been sent to me over the last several weeks and it's really disturbing. She said on the same page that her belief was a recent belief based on the enormous amount of information and evidence that's come to me. You know, we, in the practice of law, the practice of law in a courtroom is not politics. The, the rules that apply to po politicians who can say things like, I have it on a bunch of sources that this thing happened. We can't do that. We have to, dis or it's not like even journalism where you can have secret sources, right? Now, one would respect or expect that a journalist would have something to back up their secret sources, but it's not like that in the law. You have to have something to back up what you say. So just saying, yeah, people have been saying there's rumors about it. You, you can't just say those type of things. You can't make those type of claims without any evidence to back them up. After 36 pages of discussion, the court found itself still asking Ms. Kuhnha for the evidence about Judge Edelman's bias against non-Jews, the disabled, and women who complained about abuse. The court asked, where do these things come up? Was there an incident? And again, two pages later, what I want is your evidence about him favoring Jews, the non-disabled, and men. Ultimately, the upshot of Ms. Kunha's claim about Judge Edelman's favoring Jews appears on page 39 of the transcript, where I have learned, and I will admit that I'm naive to this particular subject, subject is that Attorney Aldrich is Jewish, Attorney Hurwitz is Jewish, the, the custody L evaluator in this case, Dr. Byron Caverly is Jewish, Dr. Horowitz, the supposed reunification therapist, is Jewish in this case. Because Ms. Kunha had already alleged on page 15 that Judge Edelman was a racketeer, as a mobster might be, the court asked on pages 43, 57 to 58 if Ms. Kunha was claiming a conspiracy. Her answer on that page was unequivocal and repeated. This is the transcript. The court, are you saying they're all Jewish or something and that they conspired? Attorney Kunha, oh yes. The court, just to be clear, I just want to make sure I have. So what you're claiming is that Judge Hurwitz and Judge Grossman favor lawyers who are Jewish. Attorney Kunha. Yes. Attorney Kunha. I will say that in this particular case, as in other cases, the conduct is consistently favorable to attorneys and professionals of the Jewish faith. Of particular concern to the court at the hearing was Ms. Kunha's claim that her allegation about favoring Jews was based on quote, the enormous amount of information and evidence that's come to me. The court pressed for it, and Ms. Kunha finally said at page 58, with the court's emphasis added, that it was about a list of cases where the bias would appear. Attorney Kunha, but when you start looking at the cases and you start looking at the professionals engaged in the cases, it is consistent and it supports that claim. The court, Okay, so we've talked about this and maybe this is the time for me to press you on it. You said that, so the, so you claim that he favors Jewish professionals and attorney Aldrich in particular. Where would I look to find that? In other words, did you survey a list of cases in which attorney, in which whatever attorney Aldrich says she gets and, or you say maybe there's, maybe there's a hundred cases and that the Jewish lawyers always win or something? You... You must have a basis for saying what you're saying. What is it? Where would I look to find it? So important here. These types of claims are salacious to say the least. That a, and to say it to the judge and to allege it in a proceeding in which you're seeking to recuse the judge or remove the judge for the, from the case for bias, you are making an allegation that this judge is Jewish and therefore is favoring attorneys and other parties 
who are Jewish simply because they're Jewish. And then when you're pressed for where you get this information from, you say, I took a survey of his previous cases, maybe, but that's not really what you're saying. You're just saying there were previous cases in which he favored Jewish people, but you can't point to any particular instances. That's going to get you in trouble because despite what the I think the general public might have an idea that lawyers can kind of say and do whatever just to win the case. Like we can make any claims to just win the case and we literally cannot do that, right? We should make whatever arguments that we can make that are supported by the facts, okay? So if we have facts, there could be facts out there that another judge, say Judge Jones, only favors people with uh, dreadlocks. Dr judge Jones has dreadlocks, only favors other attorneys with dreadlocks. And then if you have proof that in every single case in which an attorney with dreadlocks appeared, Judge Jones ruled in that attorney's favor, no matter the facts of the case, that's certainly something you could raise in a request to remove Judge Jones from your case because you're an attorney without dreadlocks. But if you have no evidence to support that, and that's just a hunch that you have, you cannot allege that against a judge um, in a proceeding to have that judge removed from your case. S attorney Kunha responds, so I'm just, I have a list of cases where Attorney Aldrich was one of the attorneys where Attorney Hurwitz is the guardian ad litem and either Judge Grossman, who's I'm guessing also Jewish, or specifically Judge Edelman, emphasis added. So here's the thing, You're, this is so anti-Semitic that it is ridiculous. Like the, <laughs> this is so anti-Semitic. The anti-Semitism is jumping out all over the place. She just, any other random judge who has a name that sounds Jewish to her. So she says either Judge Grossman or Judge Edelman, you're here about Judge Edelman. Why are you talking about Judge Grossman? Okay, so the court, this is about Judge Edelman. So Attorney Kunha, right. Well, it's also about Judge Grossman because Judge Edelman denied my motion to recuse her without prejudice. But then he sends a motion for clarification to Judge Grossman, knowing the concerns I have with her. So it's a vicious cycle. The court, this is a part of the broader Jewish conspiracy, in other words. Kunha, correct. Oh, so you are alleging, without any evidence to, the, to, to prove this, that the Jewish judges are conspiring to only help the Jewish attorneys with no data to back that up, no testimony from any witnesses to back that up, you think that they are involved in a conspiracy with one another that favors Chester's, is against the disabled, and favors only Jews and is against women. Does this not sound like some completely insane conspiracy talk to you guys where people say things like Jewish people are part of some cabal and that they secretly run the government? This is an attorney spouting that absolute nonsense in a hearing to determine whether or not to to preclude a, a judge from sitting on a case. This is mind blowing to me. Mind blowing. I just I cannot believe I cannot believe it that an attorney is doing this in court. Myself being an attorney. I've never seen anyone do something like this before. Never I've never seen this. Oh wow. The court Judge Grossman and Judge Edelman, all right. So what cases should I look at? Give me your examples. What cases should I look at? Attorney Kunha, just one moment. After some fumbling about one potential case at page 60 of the transcript, and with emphasis added here by the court, the court pressed again for the list of cases as Ms. Kunha claimed to be searching through her computer. The court, well, I assumed you must have had a list already because you... Yeah, you didn't come prepared to the hearing. It took to page 60 for you to come up with your list. You weren't prepared with your list in the hearing where they're going to be talking about whether or not there's some widespread Jewish conspiracy in Connecticut court, ma'am, ma'am. <sighs> Attorney Kunha, I, the court, well, you claim that this was a pattern Attorney Kunha, I do. I'm just trying to pull the list up, Judge. The court, I see. 
<laughs> Attorney Kunha, I have different screens up, so I'm trying to get to it. I'm just taking a little bit, a little. And so it went until Miss Kunha was finally forced to admit that she didn't have the list. She said she was just trying to pull up. The list showing Judge Edelman consistently favoring Jews over non-Jews. Indeed, Ms. Kunha finally gave up pretending after the court waited for half an hour while she said she was looking for the list. The court gave her every chance to produce it. So by the way, if what you want to do is to print that list and to make it an exhibit, we can do that if you have that list ready to print. Show us the cases in which Judge Edelman or Judge Grossman particularly favored Jewish attorneys, Jewish litigants, or other parties in the case like doctors and experts that are Jewish. We'll wait. That's what the court, they're like, we'll wait, we'll wait. And attorney Kunha says, can we do that during the break? And then we can go over the names. <laughs> when, at the la when at last the break was over and the court returned to the topic of the list of cases where Judge Edelman and Judge Grossman, who's not even a part of this case, poor Judge Grossman, allegedly favored Jews, Ms. Kuhnhaus' claim was of enormous amount of information and evidence proved entirely false. This is such, this is such significant language from the court significant language guys when it um okay so uh by that time her enormous claim had boiled down solely to the list of cases showing a pattern but at last miss kunha admitted the list she said existed in fact never existed okay so there was a no enormous amount of information or evidence so then she said no but i have a list of cases and then when called upon to produce the list of cases in a court of law, she couldn't produce the list of cases. The court, but in the terms of what, of what you, in terms of what you said about favoring Jews over non-Jews, you, 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 there isn't a list of cases that you're pointing to me about that. Is that, is that right? There, there is not judge. There's no list of cases. Instead, Ms. Kunha hastily turned to her next claim. A list of cases she said showed Judge Edelman protecting sexually abusive men. We will return to that later. Oh, I can't wait. I'm excited. But first, the court should consider the relative significance of an attorney making a baseless charge of racism against the judge. That's exactly what you're claiming. You're claiming that they are favoring members of their own race against other people simply because they are members of their own race. That is racism that's discrimination right it should be easy to see that this is a monstrous claim to make without thought without evidence without restraint repeatedly on the record in court with a specific claim about a list that proves not to exist this is a matter about a lawyer when lawyers speak the public rightly assumes they don't speak lightly after all, the truth is their business. I couldn't agree more. Therefore, Ms. Kunha's lies about a Jewish conspiracy are particularly reprehensible. Without the court exposing them as lies, the public might give them some credit when they deserve none. Misconduct like this threatens to drag the courts into, into the primordial ooze that passes for public discourse in some quarters today. I, I, I could not agree more. I could not agree more. I couldn't agree more even if I wanted to. I couldn't agree more if I tried. The discourse today is so base and disgusting. And we as attorneys in court cannot incorporate that into our arguments. We can't just start making up fake news or whatever you want to call it about people because it's expedient to our arguments. So I, co I totally agree. One whiff of this swamp should be enough for the courts and those of its officers who are true to their duties to set out firmly in the other direction. A primordial ooze, a swamp. I love the wording here. 
they're very very pointed in the type of discourse that they're talking about here right are you picking up what this judge is putting down the moment is one chance to do so this moment they go back to attorney kunha attorney kunha so i'm just I have a list of cases where attorney Aldrich was one of the attorneys where Anthony Hurwitz is the guardian ad litem and either Judge Grossman or specifically Judge Edelman. Emphasis at, oh, how did I get here? And this leads us to consider the seriousness of Ms. Kunha's second lie. This one goes to the heart of the Ambrose case itself. So remember, remember, this is a divorce case a family case that this all came out of, a divorce case, where she was representing one of the parties and complained that the judge was being biased against her because the other attorneys were Jewish and she wasn't, right? So this one goes to the heart of the Ambrose case itself. Karen Ambrose, now Re Reardon, or Riordan? I'm gonna go with Reardon, claims her husband, Christopher Ambrose, has abused their children. It has been no part of this judge's duty to decide whether this is true. That question is for the judge trying the case. The issue before this judge has been Ms. Kunha's claim that Judge Edelman consistently shields abusers. Most important for this ruling, Ms. Kunha claimed emphatically and repeatedly, repeatedly that DCF, uh, it's probably Family Services, Children's Services, records would reveal that the claims against Christopher Ambrose have been found to be true and Judge Edelman has been ignoring this specifically at pages 97 and 99 to 100 of the transcript with emphasis added by the court she insisted the court could find in DCF record exhibit 71 the conclusion of a multidisciplinary task force that Christopher Ambrose abused his children this is from attorney Kunha. Attorney Kunha, but they are complaining of assault. It has been established that the complaints have been sustained by a multidisciplinary task force team who recommended those children not be with their father. And because of the lies presented to the court by the guardian ad litem and attorney Aldrich manipulating the facts, Judge Edelman has ignored the real evidence. The court. If I look at that DCF document, within that document, there are the conclusions of a multidisciplinary task force that Christopher Ambrose has assaulted his children repeatedly and that the task force recommends that he, that they be taken away from him. Is that what? Attorney Kunha, yes, yes. And you will also find that the legal department for DCF recommends that DCF file a take into custody matter with the juvenile court, which would mean that uh, this Department of Family Services is asking that um, they, the children be removed from the home or be removed from the father. Attorney Kunha, it's exhibit number 71, the court. Okay, I'll look at that. And you want me to conclude from, from that, that was a matter you brought to the court's attention, that it is a clear conclusion, essentially, that the children are in immediate danger. Attorney Kunha, yes. The court, the DCF, the DCF report, Attorney Kunha, yes. The court will quote this task force saying that, that the father committed abuse against the children and should be, and they shouldn't be allowed with him. That's what I'll find in there, right? Attorney Kunha, yes, absolutely. Yes, that's what you're gonna find. Sometimes we can say absolutely about some things. This is about to the court. As the court previously concluded, the report absolutely did not include any conclusion from a multidisciplinary task that Christopher Ambrose abused his children. Ms. Kunha wasn't telling the truth about what was in it. Indeed, the entire record in the case contains nowhere a multidisciplinary task force finding that Christopher Ambrose assaulted his children. The court even proposed to the parties to unseal all the exhibits so that all could see what this, that this was not so. Both sides strenuously objected so the court won't unseal Exhibit 71 or other documents with details about the family, which is fair. Still, the DCF records do show some things bearing on the basic question whether Judge Edelman was ignoring agency findings that Christopher Ambrose abused his children. 
They show that Ms. Kunha made a related claim that was another baseless fabrication. She repeated it even in the face of this disciplinary hearing. At pages 52 to 59 of the Exhibit B, January 10th, 2020 transcript, 2022 transcript, excuse me, Ms. Kunha doubled down on a claim that DCF never investigated Mr. Ambrose and never cleared him. Attorney Kunha, my notes, for, my notes further reflect that DCF did not investigate the claims of assault. DCF did not, Attorney Kunha. In fact, the exact testimony from the DCF workers is that he was never investigated for assault by DCF. Attorney Kunha, Judge, you're not going to find substantiation or unsubstantiation because that was not the nature of the proceedings that took place with DCF. The reality of what DCF did shows that Ms. Kunha's disrespect for the truth is glaring and makes her offenses of the most serious kind. She said these things with access to all of the proposed and admitted exhibits in the case. She said these things after attorney Aldrich named the key exhibits for her in the hearing prior to this one. She said them with her career on the line. So I want to make it clear. There's two separate hearings. Well, there's kind of three. There's the original hearing before Judge Edelman that uh, led to attorney Kunha filing a motion um, uh, to be reviewed by the Superior Court. She then files a motion uh, to have Judge Edelman removed from the case for racial bias and discrimination. The courts have the hearing on that motion and then they have concern that Attorney Kunha may have made misrepresentations to them so then these disciplinary proceedings were brought. So this is the third proceeding, the disciplinary proceeding. So the Exhibit B refers to the, to the uh, disciplinary proceeding. So at the proceeding on whether or not to remove Judge Edelman, she says that DCF did evaluate um, the father and found that the father was abusing the children. And then in the second hearing, the disciplinary hearing that concerns her own license, she lies and said DCF never even evaluated him on the issue of the claims of assault, which contradicts her previous statements. So she made these contradictions knowing her career was on the line at the time. It is vital to the public interest to show the extent of Ms. Kunha's wrongdoing. Therefore, the court will partially overrule both parties. It will publish limited DCF documents that directly address Ms. Kunha's assertion that DCF never investigated or cleared Mr. Ambrose. The court has balanced the family interest in privacy with the public interest in the integrity of the courts. The rules command that the court give the latter priority, but it has no fear about the former. It will not reveal any personal details of the children beyond their already public names that can be found in the complaint and throughout the proceedings. Two DCF documents will be attached as exhibits. Here is what they show about Ms. Kunha's claim, number one, that the DCF did not investigate Mr. Ambrose, and two, that DCF made no finding about whether the claims were substantiated or unsubstantiated. They are marked as Exhibit 7B and 7C for the trial. They are attached to this ruling as Exhibit C and D. They are entitled Notification of Investigation Rules. One is from October 2020 and one is from 2021. With emphasis added here by the court, they both begin by telling Mr. Ambrose, the Department of Children and Families recently investigated reportedly at, reported allegations that you abused or neglected a child or children. How could Ms. Kunha have seen the document and having heard Attorney Aldridge refer to them at the last hearing repeatedly insist that DCF did not investigate Mr. Ambrose? She could not. She could not without revealing that she lacks respect for the truth and her professional allegiance to it. What about Ms. Kunha's claim that DCF never decided whether the claims were substantiated or unsubstantiated? DCF has concluded the following. We're back to the exhibit. So as to child A, physical neglect, unsubstantiated. As to child B, abuse of a sexual nature, unsubstantiated. As to child A, 
abuse of a sexual nature, unsubstantiated. As to child B, medical neglect, unsubstantiated. As to child A, physical neglect, unsubstantiated. As to child C, physical neglect, unsubstantiated. And it goes on to list four more allegations, all unsubstantiated. The DCF documents say even more, with emphasis added here by the court. DCF finds that you do not pose a risk to the health, safety, or well-being of children. It passes understanding why a person would wager so much on blatant falsehoods. Ms. Kunha was warned repeatedly of the seriousness of this matter and still chose to reassert and insist on things about the DCF Ambrose records when she had every reason to know they were completely false. And that leads us to the next event that makes Ms. Kunha's wrongdoing so serious. Prior to the hearing, the court gave Ms. Kunha almost a month's warning. The court told her she faced serious potential consequences. The court urged her to hire a lawyer. Oh no, she didn't hire a lawyer. Oh my goodness, that explains so much. So in disciplinary proceedings, attorneys have the right to have the assistance of counsel to represent them in hearings uh, for disbarment or suspension or anything like that. The court urged her to hire a lawyer and warned, it warned her that it was giving leave for the chief disciplinary counsel's office to appear as amicus curiae, as a friend and advisor to the court. The court ho hoped that Ms. Kunha would reconsider her claims. It expected she might say how she came in good faith to believe the things that proved to be false. And that's, we're giving you an out. We're saying, okay, all right, you believe something. Maybe you had a hunch. Maybe you had a feeling in court. Maybe your feelings were hurt, emotions ran high, and so you made some claims. But now you've been given evidence that these claims just aren't true, right? They're just not true. You can back away from them, back away from them. And she refused. It wanted her to explain about her background, her experience as a lawyer, and hear a plan that would include diligent devotion to the truth in the future. They gave her an opportunity to cure her wrongdoing, which not everyone gets, right? The court said as much at the hearing. Instead, here, with emphasis added by the court, is what the court heard from Ms. Kunha at page four of the Exhibit B transcript. Attorney Kunha, there's quite a few other issues, Judge. Frankly, your findings are clearly erroneous. I find these proceedings to be intentionally harassing an intimidation and an attempt by your honor solely to shut me down for the corruption that I have raised before the court. So instead of fixing your behavior, hiring counsel and taking this seriously, you not only attack the judge in the trial court, you now attack the judge in the superior court. Your honor has engaged in malfeasance gross malfeasance. I will not be intimidated. <laughs> I will not be harassed by this court. You claimed a widespread Jewish conspiracy and you're saying you're being harassed? I will remind this court that your so-called historical writing memorandum of decision where you touch upon the history that is that it is it is a joke and it is pathetic and you should be ashamed of yourself for subjecting myself to that type of rhetoric. Frankly, Judge, I am ashamed to even be sitting before you with the type of conduct that you engaged in. You have engaged in material misrepresentation. You have lied to the public. This is Miss Kunha. This is the pot calling the kettle black. You have done so solely to put me in a poor light among the public and to interfere with my constitutional rights as an individual of this state. Girl, what? What, Miss Kunha? No. 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 Let me just tell you this. All attorneys have constitutional rights. But there are, it, 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 whoo, 
Those rights are curtailed in certain circumstances. You have a First Amendment right of free speech. For the most part, you can say whatever you want, right? However, you cannot make material misrepresentations in court. Perjury is one of those exceptions to free speech. Slander and libel is another one of them. <sighs> my constitutional rights and my client's constitutional rights. And at page 19 of the Exhibit B, this is the disciplinary hearing, transcript with emphasis added by the court, after additional browbeating by Ms. Kunha, the court asked her to stop. The court. Attorney Kunha, I'm going to ask you to stop speaking. Attorney Kunha, yes, Judge, yes, I will obey. Your Honor would like me to bow? I'm sorry. I am below you. I will obey. I will be quiet. No problem. Thank you. Ms. Kunha's behavior at the hearing highlights the seriousness of her misconduct and is one of the aggravating circumstances the court considers under the rules of professional conduct. Now, they mean aggravating in that it makes the factors worse in deciding what the punishment will be. But to me, when I hear aggravating, I just feel like she was getting on y'all's nerves. <laughs> and she would have gotten on my nerves too. God, she's rude. Rule 3.1. Forbids lawyers from making meritless claims in court. Rule 3.2 requires lawyers to expedite rather than delay cases. Rule 3.3 prohibits lawyers from knowingly providing false information in court. Rule 3.5 requires decorum and bars lawyers from disrupting proceedings. I don't think it's very de decorous or decorous to say I will bow down to you, judge. I am below you, judge. That's not decorum. Rule 8.2 prohibits lawyers recklessly impugning a judge's integrity. And we also cannot recklessly impugn another attorney's integrity either. We can't just say, Your, Your Honor, this other lawyer is an a-hole. We can't do that. Rule 8.4 prohibits lawyers from dishonesty or deceit. Lord. Rule 8.4 prohibits lawyers from hindering the administration of justice. Ms. Kunha wrongly asserts that her misconduct as a lawyer is protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. But if the First Amendment doesn't allow anyone to falsely cry fire in a crowded theater, it certainly doesn't permit a lawyer to falsely claim conspiracy in a crowded courtroom. As the United States Supreme Court reminded us in 1991 in Gentile v. State B of Nevada, it is unquestionable that in the courtroom itself, during a judicial proceeding, whatever right to free speech an attorney has is extremely circumscribed. As the appellate division in the New York Supreme Court read in Ray Giuliani in 2021 when Giuliani was disbarred and we talked about that here, there may be limits on that circumscription of attorney speech but those limits aren't implicated in any way by a court punishing an attorney for lying in court. Which means that we are there by the grace of the courts allowing us to be there. We receive our license because we worked and we studied hard for it. But we have a license that has to be maintained and certain standards that we have to follow. And so our speech rights are curtailed by that. And that is okay. The courts are fine with lawyers having our free speech rights curtailed because they don't want us lying in court. The court finds just cause here by clear and convincing evidence. It finds that this barment is particularly appropriate because Ms. Kunha's false claims against Judge Edelman consisted of claims that he was biased against non-Jews, biased against the disabled, and biased against women alleging abuse. The Connecticut Supreme Court upheld the disbarment of a lawyer who alleged bias against a judge in 2003. We're talking about precedent here. Right on, another lawyer has already been disbarred for doing something like this. In Burden v. Modelies. In doing so, the court noted, of all the charges that might be leveled against one sworn to administer justice and to faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon a judge, a charge of bias must be deemed at or near the very top of seriousness, for bias kills the very soul of judging fairness. I'm going to end this video there. I think that the court's ruling was completely correct. This was some of the most outrageous courtroom behavior I have ever heard of. I kind of wish it was on video so we could all see it, but I hope that you guys got a feeling for 
how outrageous it was. I would love to know what you guys think in the comments section down below. Do you have any questions about why this behavior should disbar her from practicing? Do you think that maybe it's a little unfair because maybe judges should be able to make claims of bias if they think there is bias? The only thing I can think that would kind of count against this is, okay, what if, what if judges are actually being biased but you have no way to prove it right would this put a chilling effect on people that genuinely believe that bias existed i just don't think so i think her behavior was so outrageous that this doesn't apply to anybody but her and that's why it's an unreported opinion her behavior was just beyond the pale but i want to know what you guys think so i will talk to you later take care of yourselves bye